university at the Faculty of Theology specifically. The late Professor Pleikis van Huffel embodied what she stood for and what we can still try to emulate, justice, transformation, and excellence. She stood fiercely for gender justice, and she continues to inspire new generations of scholars and ecumenical leaders. Today, we remember her legacy with her family, siblings and husbands, scholars, and her students. Today, we remain challenged by her courage, persistence, her dedication. Now, she was not always acknowledged for that, yet that is what is at the heart of her scholarship, her leadership and pastoral wellness, namely the commitment to the way of the cross of Jesus Christ. David and those who know her well can bear me out, yes, she was an ecumenical leader, a reformed scholar, feminist, yet at the heart of this, connecting this identity, the complexity of this identity was a commitment to the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, she was at the heart an evangelical scholar. Thomas Merton described the significance of the cross as follows, and I quote, In the dying on the cross, Christ manifested the holiness of God in apparent contradiction with itself. But in reality, this manifestation was the complete denial and rejection of all human ideas of holiness and perfection. The wisdom of God became folly to humanity. His power manifested itself in weakness, and his holiness was in their eyes unholy. But scripture bears out that what is great in the eyes of humanity is an abomination in the sight of God. And Merton continues, if then we want to seek some way of being holy, we must first of all renounce our own ways and our own wisdom. We must empty ourselves as he did. We must deny ourselves in some, in some sense make ourselves nothing in order that we, may, that we may live not so much in ourselves as in him. We must live a power by the power and in a light that seem not to be there. We must live by the strength of an apparent emptiness that is always truly empty and yet never fails to support us at every moment. This, Merton concludes, is true holiness. And I believe this is what Professor Pleikis van Huffel also stood for. And today we are honored and excited to welcome our speaker, Emeritus Professor Miranda Pillay, who have journeyed with Professor Pleikis van Huffel, who stood together in many a struggle, facing the same demons that, is, that are still with us. We want to acknowledge also our host today, holding the space in wisdom and grace, Dr. Marlin Malkoto, minister at the Easter Free South Congregation. Um, we also want to welcome the family and the friends of Professor Pleikis van Huffel. We want to welcome staff members, academic staff members from the institution here, but also from the various institutions that Professor Pleikis van Huffel represented. Um, we want to welcome students uh, of, his, of Professor Pleikis van Huffel. We want to welcome also members of our various ecumenical parties. Dear friends, as we welcome each other, let us be reminded of her legacy and let us allow ourselves to be challenged. I give over to Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Mali Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sunil, for those prophetic words. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am going to hand over to, um, let me just get all the titles right, to Kanan Dr. Desmond Lambrecht, who will do the opening prayer for us. Thank you so much. And I think with that, I will also invite Professor Pele to take a seat because after this, I'm going to do the introduction. Thank you. Good morning. In God's as he journey as a priest amongst your people. Bless this gathering and also bless the speaker, Professor Miranda Palay, and others who will be part of this celebration. May this lecture in ignite us and propel us into action where there is injustice, gender violence, and the marginalized who are not yet at the table. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Miranda Pillay. Miranda Pillay started her teaching career at a primary school in Port Elizabeth, now Tebeja. Her interest in the study of religion and theology happened organically during her undergraduate studies at the then University of Port Elizabeth Center for Continuing Education. As biblical studies was one of the limited choices for part-time students at this off-campus site, it was a matter of the subject choosing her. Discovering that there were different approaches to reading the Bible was a eureka moment that directed Miranda's career in academia. The topic of her doctoral research project, Revisioning Stigma, a socio-rhetorical reading of Luke 10, 25, 37, in the context of HIV AIDS in South Africa, 
continues to inform her research in the field of religion and social justice. With insights gained from feminist theology, womanist ethics, and African women theologians, her research examines the ways in which culture and religion uphold sexism, classism, racism, and genderism as holy hierarchies, while also holding possible resources for challenging oppressive barriers. Miranda taught New Testament studies at the University of the Western Cape for 18 years before her retirement in 2017. She is currently Extraordinary Professor at UWC, affiliated with the Desmond Tutu Center for Religion and Social Justice. Miranda, welcome once again. And we are ready and eager to hear what you have to say to us today. Miranda's uh, theme for today is Trailblazing Women of the Patriarchal Beaten Track. Welcome, Miranda. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Dean. And to say that uh, Mary Ann and I traveled is true, even literary. We uh, were together in 2008 uh, on uh, Mind the Gap um, journey, uh, and we shared a room somewhere in London. <laughs> somewhere in London, yes, we shared a room. <clears throat> Dean of the Faculty of Theology, Professor Reginell, colleagues, students, family and friends of the late Professor Reverend Dr. Mary Ann Plagis van Huffel, friends. Good afternoon to all of you here in this space. I love this space and I'm glad we moved from the Ati somebody to somebody here. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to present the fourth annual memorial lecture in remembrance of Pref Professor Mary Ann Plakis van Huffel. I'm honored to be here to celebrate and commemorate with you the life and legacy of Professor Mary Ann. Today we gathered to remember her leadership in various communities, those who work the vineyards and those who own the vineyards, literally and figuratively speaking. From Robertson and Scottsdale to Stellenbosch, from Prisca to priesthood, from classrooms to boardrooms, from Wellington to the World Council of Churches. There is no doubt that Professor Mary Ann Plakis van Huffel is amongst the women who, according to Schusler Fiorenza, quote, have moved into the academy, assumed religious leadership, and claimed their religious agency and heritage, unquote. But truth be told, as a woman of color, Professor Mary Ann Plakis van Huffel had to navigate her leadership and exercise her agency along a patriarchal beaten track, where somewhat faded white privilege signposts still remain. I make this observation in light of Mary Ann's own work, and I will from now on also refer to it just as Mary Ann and Professor Mary Ann, just for the sake of conversation as well. While I agree with Sujla Fiorenza that women like Mary Ann are now present in the academy, that they are in leadership positions claiming their religious agency and heritage, it remains an ardently ongoing task for many. This is the premise of my lecture. I was asked to focus on the leadership legacy of Professor Mary Ann so much of the, what I will present here is also the basis of 
Mary Ann's own research and community engagement, reflecting her lived experiences as a woman of color, born, raised, and educated during apartheid South Africa. Thus, it is not surprising that first, much of her research is framed within the social, economic, and political realities of racism, sexism, and classism in South Africa, and its complex ramifications in post-apartheid South Africa. Second, Mary Ann's publications not only exhibit how the intersections of race, class, gender, and ability continue to impact the lives and livelihoods of different people differently in a now democratic South Africa. It also exhibits an awareness that what she knows about the experiences of other bodies is not everything there is to know. She employs a post-structural feminist discourse to deconstruct dualisms operative in Western epistemologies and emphasizes that such dualisms not only serve to justify and maintain gender binaries, but that they also function as justification for domination on the basis of class, race, and ethnicity. Third, Mary Ann's experiences as a woman of color working in a culture of patriarchy reveal how taxing it is for women leaders who have the relentless task of confronting social and gender biases in contexts where women are expected, if not required, to stay on the androcentric paths of a patriarchal beaten track. My understanding of Mary Ann's concerns for social justice is shaped by my own social location as a Christian South African woman of color who, like Mary Ann, was born during the 1950s a despondent yet feisty teenager during the 70s, a hopeful yet suspicious young adult during the 80s, inspired by the promises of the 90s through to the 2000s, which bring me to this time and place of really being hot for. <laughs> and I'm aware that many people might think that such a vulgar language that, that such vulgar language is not becoming and that hashtag enough is enough placards would be a more respectable way of express of expressing my hurtfulness. <laughs> that women have to march, I'm really hurtful, that women have to march over and over again in protest against the violence and violation of body and being. But I am hurtful of women being allowed to be leaders in previously male-dominated ecclesial spaces and then given a hamster wheel to become barn breakers. Yet, at this time, I am also hopeful. I am hopeful because this new generation of academics and theologians, women and men, are leading the way. They are emboldened to push forward against patriarchal pushback, standing on the legendary shoulders of women leaders like Mary Ann, they have the advantage of range and perspective to survey the patriarchal beaten track and see how the first woman two badges are also badgering. <coughs> An observation I will return to later in the lecture. But first, I want to further foreground my presentation with reference to Mary Ann's trailblazing journey through the ecclesial ranks of Urza. A well-documented journey, registered amongst others by Charles Flandor in 2014 and in 2021 by Salelo Cutler and Willy Zeze, respectively. In my view, in some ways, Flandor's argument made before Mary Ann's death sets out to prove that Mary Ann's ecclesial advancement was one of merit and not tokenism, which could also be an attempt to, in defense of the establishment of the credibility of the establishments and its institutions concerned. While all three male authors mentioned here praise Mary Ann for being the first woman to lead this or that organization, Hutta 
in his recount of Mary Ann's leadership journey also registers the frustration and despair which she encountered on the patriarchal beaten track of church leadership, much of which Mary Ann herself boldly declares almost a decade earlier. He notes, for example, that Mary Ann was the first woman to be ordained in and appointed to the leadership of the church after a long wait for ordination. Also that Mary Ann was the first woman minister of the word in the Uniting Reformed Church of South Africa, that her first experience as ordained minister was one of rejection as she was not allowed to perform her ministerial function as pastor, Plagis van Huffel, and her presence as a human leader was not recognized by many congregants, some of whom not only refused the services as pastor and minister of the word, but also left to join congregations headed by male ministers. Third, Cutler notes that in 2012, Mary Ann became the first woman to be elected as moderator of URXA, and that her not being elected for a second time or a second term was a humiliating experience for her. Noteworthy is that these three male authors, which I have named, use Mary Ann Plakis van Huffel's experiences as the first woman leader to this and that, as well as her published research, praising her accomplishments and ability as a woman leader, albeit for different, different rhetorical responses. They all write about Mary Ann while reappropriating her research and her experiences without any reflexivity on their own compliance with patriarchal normativity. For example, Willie Zezes' 21, 2021 article with a question mark title, What Does Mary Ann Elizabeth Plakis van Huffel Have to Say to Silent Partners of the Reformed World, contains many verbatim quotations from Mary Ann's own research, which she uses together with many posts from a Facebook page. This he does without any reflexivity on his own positionality. <coughs> but he does conclude with a conviction that though she, Mary Ann, is deceased, she is still speaking to reformed women in the reformed world. Yes, 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 cites Hebrews 11, 4, and please go and read Hebrews 11, 4. He quotes Hebrews 11, 4 as a source suggesting that Mary Ann, even though she is dead, has, some, has something to say to her silent partners, whom he identifies as the women of the reformed world. As I've said on many previous occasions, patriarchy is so deeply entrenched in the psyche of men and women that despite the presence of women in previously male-dominated academic and ecclesial spaces, patriarchy continually raises its chauvinistic head. And while women may no longer be excluded from leadership positions, it is as some f feminists have identified, second generation gender bias that is the more subtle, less visible, oftentimes unintentional, and sometimes patronizing forms of discrimination that remains a problem to be addressed by both men and women in leadership. An example of second generation gender bias is that in many instances, women leaders are othered in patriarchal normative cultures where leaders are expected to be assertive. It then stands to reason that when women whose leadership styles are collaborative and participative are not recognized as real leaders. Then again, women who do act assertively, like moi, are oftentimes <laughs> perceived as being aggressive or bossy. Because second generation gender bias may be seen, if not defended, as being unconscious behavior, there is a greater need for awareness of patriarchal normative, normative racial and gender pushback. Moreover, 
The mere presence of women and othered bodies does not automatically transform the patriarchal heteronormative culture of ecclesial and academic spaces. Because as we all well know, representation doesn't equal transformation. A point also made by Plaikis van Huffel as she argues in Patriarchy as Empire, a theological reflection, she argues that sexism, patriarchy, and hierarchical societal structures still prevail in post-apartheid South Africa, and that the presence of women in the ecclesial and societal structures is not an indicator of, tr of transformation." Unquote. However, women leaders do inhabit positions of power and privilege, and they do participate in production of knowledge and public opinion, which ought to dispel the simplistic view of women as powerless. Samba. <laughs> you see them, it's just click, click. <laughs> this picture, you will agree with me, has a life of its own. And it's worth a thousand stories. And as already mentioned, much of Mary Ann's research is framed by stories that emerge from this picture. Now, if I must stand here and speak into this picture, you will be, still be here tomorrow morning. So I'll leave that picture for it to tell your story. Thus, while we pause to celebrate and commemorate the accomplishments of women leaders, of women leading marches, of women leading the church, we are called to also commiserate, to lament and to ask, how many more trailblazers will it take for gender justice to be taken seriously in ecclesial and academic spaces? Second, there's a need to commiserate the fact that the general, if not natural expectation is that women who are allowed into leadership positions are expected to lead on a patriarchal beaten track. In other words, they can have bond breaker status as long as they don't break the bond. As long as, as, long as, they, as long as they have no intention of breaking the barriers which keep women in their stereotypical uh, gendered lane. And very often we actually hear people tell us Stay in your lane. Third, there is a need to commiserate the fact that trailblazing women are burdened over and over again, generation after generation, with, on, with the ongoing task of clearing weeds that cushion the patriarchal track of male privilege. To commiserate, to lament in the context of commemoration, gives us the liberty to ask with a hermeneutic of suspicion. What is it about leadership of women like Mary Ann that we ought to celebrate? What are the real celebratory milestones or are they milestones? There to keep women on a, the patriarchal normative track. What might it take for trailblazing women leaders to set previously male-dominated ecclesial and academic spaces on fire and burn the weed cushioned patriarchal beaten track? What would it take to break the cycle of patriarchal heteronormativity and hegemonic masculinity and clear alternative paths off the beaten track? With these questions in mind, I will discuss the following. Do you know? There we go. I just thought that was a trick to keep me on the on the wheel. <laughs> right. Perhaps we need to redirect the badge of honor rhetoric and resist second generation gender bias and employ reflexive solidarity where the legitimate presence of women um, and other bodies are recognized. 
redirect the badge of honor rhetoric. There is no doubt that Mary Ann's leadership took her on paths that opened up the way for many other women. I say this with a mindfulness that using women as a category in a way that means all women is an exclusionary and discriminatory way of constructing an alleged universality of women. The fact that women as a category does not represent a homogeneous group is particularly true of South African context, where some women continue to benefit from white privilege, while women of color carry a double and sometimes triple burden of having to carve out, quote, carve out more and more spaces for themselves and others to come, unquote. In an article, Recognition, Resistance, and Rest, drawing from the humanist wells of Katie Geneva Cannon, Nadar and Robertson argue that women waymakers come with a price tag, which gives black women both a badge of honor and also a prize of great burden. Trailblazing women in their own right, Nadar and Robertson, standing on the shoulders of waymaker women have perspective to see the responsibility and obligation that comes with being a pioneer. Thus, they redirect our attention to consider how taxing the burden of being the first is even though it constructs narratives of black excellence and exceptionalism. Moreover, the glowing narratives further obscure and preclude the accountability that the structures which prevented women from being in those positions of power must bear. This point is illustrated by Nadar and Robertson, citing Taniko Maluleka, who in an opinion editorial piece, Celebrate Black Female Leaders, warns that labeling black women leaders as the first to be appointed to leadership positions is mischievously elevated into becoming the biggest portion of the truth while really ex obscuring the fact that they are not the first women capable of leading great institutions. Wow. They are amongst the first to be allowed to. For hundreds of years, says Maluleka, many capable black women were denied the conditions and not given the opportunity to lead by racist and patriarchal forces who blocked crushed and often killed them. Nadar and Robertson go on to argue that being given the label of firsts defines the way in which many black women are characterized as ex exceptional. Thus, their exceptionality also glows in light of achieving and celebrating black excellence. But as they point out, what this narrative often ignores is that the very idea of black excellence and being first supports and often perpetuate white capitalist and patriarchal ideals. Also, that narratives of black excellence individualize exceptionalism as an award to those creative, courageous, resilient, and intelligent black women. But worse still is that exceptionalism is seen to be the achievement of those women whose values and determination result from their struggle with oppression. You know, those of us who could go through the glass ceiling of a standard eight certificate, for example, you know, and put the responsibility to overcome on those who are experiencing a life of struggle. These arguments indicate, in my view, the need to redirect the badge of honor rhetoric away from the badgering burden it holds for women in general, and black women in particular, towards holding institutions to account. One way of doing so is to resist second generation gender bias, such as stereotyping. 
in a radio station interview on Radio Sonder Grense in 2012, Mary Ann commented on her experience in Robertson, where she started her ordained ministry as the first woman minister of the word in Urza. Quote, I realized soon after my arrival that I would not only bring the gospel to these people, but that I also would have to deal with stereotyping and conservatism in an environment of poverty. And as she herself points out, gender stereotypes so deeply entrenched in the patriarchal structures of the church continue to uphold views aimed at keeping women in the lane that would ensure their compliance with good Christian values. As I've pointed out on previous occasions, the task of womanist, feminist, African women theologians cannot just be to expose patriarchy as oppressive or describe how traditional and popular cultures collude with the patriarchy of our faith, or merely challenge the conservative stereotypical characterization of women and the regulative standards of action for women and men in patriarchal normative contexts. We also have to resist conforming to norms that hold the patriarchal beaten track as the only way, as the holy way. In this regard, I find Katie Cannon's idea to embrace anxiousness as a virtue helpful to resist second generation gender bias. Initially, I did find the idea very surprising and confusing when I saw that anxious had many negative connotations such as backhanded, double dealing, hypocritical, insincere, two-faced, fraudulent, and wait, pharisaic. <laughs> How then could such an idea be considered a virtue? But then I saw the same source list with some other words related to the word anxiousness or the idea as, of anxiousness as a virtue. virtue. That to be anxious also meant to be uninhibited, to wear red shoes. <laughs> Unrestrained and disarming. That when the penny, that's when the penny dropped to go off the patriarchal track. When women leaders would have to daringly, uninhibited, unrestrained and disarmingly confront the patriarchal beaten track. So anxiousness as a virtue is the subject of the chapter seven of the book of Katie Cannon, of, uh, entitled Katie's Cannon, Womanism and the Soul of the Black Community. Reflecting on the life and writings of Zora Hurston, Cannon espouses anxiousness as a virtue. And she says of Hurston that in both her life and work, Hurston embodied a sensitized candor in relation to the subtle, invisible ethos, as well as the expressed mor moral values emanating from within the cultural institutions of the black community. She maintained that black life was more than defensive reactions to the oppressive Western system of white male privilege. As a black woman artist subjected to the violence of whites, of male superiority, and of poverty, Zora Hurston offered an especially concrete frame of reference for understanding the black woman as a moral agent. Cannon describes Hurston as a, and her fictional counterparts as moral agents who, in their struggle to avoid the devastating effects of structural oppression, create various coping mechanisms that free them from imposed norms and, ex and expectations. Cannon notes how Hurston fully delineates the propositions, attitudes, and behaviors that men exhibit to support their belief in the inherent inferiority of women and their right to dominate them. According to Cannon, Hurston understood suffering imposed by dominant cultures not as a moral norm or as a desirable ethical quality as often espoused in Christian circles, but rather 
as a typical state of affairs which result from the prevailing dominant ethos. In essence, anxiousness as a virtue is the creative tension between resistance and endurance. Perhaps this is why women of faith can declare that they are hotful yet hopeful, in which case endurance is an ethical principle through which the virtue of anxiousness is embodied. As an ethical principle, endurance means that women leaders would claim the agency and risk going off the patriarchal beaten track to expose and resist all forms of oppression and discrimination. As an ethical principle of the virtue unctuousness, endurance does not mean passive acceptance, but rather endurance points to the intentionality necessary to resist the subtle, less visible, oftentimes unintentional, and sometimes patronizing forms of gender and racial biases. However, the hope of transforming previously male-dominated ecclesial and academic spaces and places will remain a pipe dream without reflexive solidarity on the part of men and women. This brings me to my third and final point. I'm so used to being chased away when my time is up that I'm actually enjoying this space. <laughs> no, not soon. <laughs> Women like Mary Ann, who carry the badge of being first to be allowed into previously male-dominated spaces, also carry the burden of having the the, uh, the legitimacy of their presence question. This rea reality calls for reflexivity from men and women in these spaces. Questions about the politics of identity, questions about reflexivity on discourses of equality are important and ought not to be dismissed. A case in point, for example, is when questions about church policies and practices that uphold and justify a patriarchal culture um, are raised, they are easily dismissed as irrelevant with a quote from Galatians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chapter and verse? 823. With no reflexivity on the interpretation of the text. Thus, reflexivity on who says what to whom to what effect, and I'm looking at my New Testament professor who taught me that. Who said what to whom to what effect is crucial if we want to hold on to the idea of solidarity as a Christian value, especially since solidarity might signal the willingness of individuals to come together to serve and promote collective concerns. But it might also be a case of, I'm, I stand in solidarity with you, you in your small corner, and I in my not so small corner. <laughs> the question is whether the idea of solidarity carries with it the recognition of bodies othered by dominant racist, classist, and sexist cult cultures in society. In the case of hierarchical ordered social arrangements such as male headship in the church, it may signal a kind of equal, unequal solidarity that justify the patriarchal beaten track. Thus, when Denise Ackerman urges men to join women in their struggle against discrimination, abuse, and violation, because because it's about the humanity of men as much as it is about the humanity of women, it implies the calling into question the unreflexive compliance with patriarchal normativity. This is particularly the case when solidarity is held as a value to advance the argument for unity without recognizing the legitimacy of diverse bodies in that space. Reflexive solidarity goes beyond the rhetoric of inclusion. It speaks to the legitimate power of presence. It is worth exploring reflexive solidarity as a paradigm to consider the we 
as we explore alternative paths off the patriarchal beaten track. In conclusion, and now it is my conclusion, as we pause to celebrate and commemorate the leadership legacy of Professor Mary Ann Plagis van Huffel in the church and in the academy, we are reminded that gender stereotypes remain deeply entrenched in the patriarchal social structures of these institutions. Second, we are reminded of the importance to be intentional about redirecting the burden that comes with a badge of the first woman two accomplishments. And we need to redirect it towards calling institutions to account for the patriarchal pushback against women's legitimate presence. Third, we are reminded to rethink solidarity as recognition and legitimate presence of persons othered by dominant discourses of racism, classism, sexism, as well as genderism. And now finally, I invoke the voice of another trailblazing woman leader, Professor Nadine Bowers de Toy, who implores us in a prayer she said last year at this occasion. She implores us to, in the years to come, hold high the values of Professor Mary Ann that Professor Mary Ann embodied. Values of justice, freedom, equity, and liberation for all. Thank you. slide could we have that um, or do they need to see my face online <laughs> yeah you know sometimes in moments like these you need to just pause for a moment and just be in the space. Thank you, Professor Pillay, for such a thought-provoking lecture. It is an, indeed an honor for me, too, to be in a position today and many other days to remember with everybody present here and those who are online the legacy of Mary Ann Plyke is wonderful. To celebrate her life, but also to lament the pain that she endured <coughs> during her ministry. We were once confronted now during this lecture with the many obstacles Mary Ann had to face. Sadly though, we are still wrestling with the same issues. And Prof. Pillay so eloquently reminded us this afternoon by shining a light and asking the question, when will gender justice be taken seriously in ecclesial and academic spaces? Also by reflecting on how women in leadership positions are expected to lead on a patriarchal beaten track, and how trailblazing women are burdened to fight male privilege. Now, Mary Ann was a woman who told stories. She was not shy to share her challenges with us, the younger generation, who had a calling and thought that things were different in the church. It is, after all, God's people, is it not? When she had time, she would invite us, the women in ministry, for coffee 
and share with us the joys of a ministry. Yes, there were joys, but also the pain that she endured. She would listen to our stories, <coughs> our struggles, but she would always encourage us to avail ourselves for leadership positions in the church. You need to be instrumental in the change of the church, our church. You need to be present around the tables. Those were her words to us. So when we are once again reminded this morning that we still have a long road ahead, I also remember the words Mary Ann wrote in an article, A History of Gender Insensitivity in Urksa, published on the 1st of October 2019. She said that the environment in our church, Urksa, and I quote, was and still is not a safe space for pioneering women, close quote. When I listened to you, Professor Pele, it opened so many wounds, not just for me, but I'm sure for many other women in ministry, but also for the men who are with us in this struggle. Mary Ann was very open about how she always had the support of her husband, David Van Affel. And I've, you know, I've been thinking about the two of them, and I can only remember a few times when I did not see them together. We were taught by a visiting lecturer during our pastoral counseling module that we should not burden our partner with the stresses of our ministry. <laughs> yes, we should rather have a mentor to offload our burdens. And I can understand where this person came from. But what if you are married to your best friend? Someone in whom you have confided even before ministry. This is what I saw with Mary Ann and David, a couple who supported each other, a couple who journeyed together, even more so where the road was full of potholes, and boy were they potholes. Through this lecture, I've been asking myself the question, do I have colleagues who are willing to, as Professor Pillay put it, clear alternative paths off the beaten track. Do I have colleagues like that? Colleagues who are willing to go against that which is seen as normal. Sadly, I must admit, only a few. When I look around, it would seem that most of my colleagues are quite comfortable on the path that they are currently traveling on. I've also observed that some of my female colleagues have quietly left social media spaces, groups, because they are tired of the toxic environment in which they must operate. Today, when we celebrate the legacy of our dear sister, Reverend Dr. Professor Mary Ann Plaikis Van Affel, such a small woman for so many titles, I'm so deeply saddened that that which she fought for so valiantly did not come to fruition in her lifetime. But that which she has left us can never be erased. In my last conversation with Mary Ann, I realized once again that she had an unshakable faith in God. It was on April 20th, 2020, while she was in hospital, that I sent her a WhatsApp message. I just wanted to assure her that she was indeed in our prayers. And she said the following to me, my sister, we are really satisfied with the faith that the Lord has bestowed on us. And we have a firm confidence that we will also be able to conquer this battle afterwards. Even on a sickbed, 
Mary Ann was gearing herself for the next battle in her life. A warrior woman. I'm so grateful for Professor Pillay who once again, in no uncertain terms this morning, shared with us that the struggle will continue. We will need to journey as men and women. We will need to journey as partners. We, as the new generation of academics, need to lead the way while we stand on the shoulders of women leaders like Mary Ann and like even you, Professor. We honor the legacy of our dear sister this afternoon, Reverend Dr. Professor Mary Ann Plaikis van Affel. May your legacy live on. Thank you. Friends, we will move now to the bursary announcement that Professor Nell will inform us about. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Makoto, and um, on behalf of uh, the faculty and, and also the department, uh, Professor Dion Foster will later also uh, do, do the word of thanks. Um, last year, we were informed and um, we were grateful that uh, Professor, the late Professor Plaikis van Hoffel in her, in her will also uh, donated uh, a percentage of um, you know the money um, of a legacy to the Faculty of Theology and to Stellenbosch University and then in particular um, she was clear uh, the family communicated to us that this should be for bursaries in the field that she taught and um, after um, listening to, to Dr. Marcotto as well as to uh, Professor Pillay, she was indeed uh, deciding and investing in her legacy, that the legacy continue. Now, of course, you might know that uh, she uh, did a doctorate in uh, church uh, history, but, but then also church polity. Uh, which means that uh, an Afrikaans kerk recht, uh, and it is then in, in the field of church polity, ecclesiology broader, that she made this bursary available to postgraduate students, women of color, uh, to continue to pursue her legacy. And, and we, we are grateful for that, and we want to support also her intentions and I want to say this to the family that um, as a university and as a faculty, um, in this way we want to continue to journey with you as a family as we continue uh, to hold and also continue uh, on, on the legacy of Professor Pleikis van Huffel. Now, the decision was that the money be invested and also from the proceeds that annually uh, the money be made available for a bursary, a postgraduate bursary, either master or doctorate um, in ecclesiology, in church history. After last year, it's been invested and there is now money available for a bursary. So we will, over the next two months, um, announce the bursary uh, in the name of Professor Blaikis van Hoffel uh, for a student to start next year. Um, we are very excited about that student that will work specifically um, in ecclesiology, kerkrecht, or church polity, uh, or uh, church, church history. Um, that is all that I can announce now. <laughs> Except to say, yes, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Um, except, uh, Dr. McMaster, I must say this. If there are any other of you who consider leaving a legacy, <laughs> consider, 
Yes, consider writing in your testimony, in your will, also. Um, <laughs> um, a, 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 a legacy, you know, that, that will also continue uh, support um, for postgraduate students um, and also then also uh, so that the work will continue. You may contact us if you consider that and we will assist you also in, in giving you some guidance in this respect. I think Professor Plyk is going to set a standard uh, that I think we all should try to emulate. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Professor Nell. Indeed, good news. I, uh, we are at the end of our gathering, but I am going to ask um, Professor Dion Foster to do a word of thanks for us. And then, um, okay, let me, let me let allow you to finish first. Thank you. Thanks, Dion. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, it's my uh, privilege to be able to offer a few words of uh, thanks um, to all of those who have participated uh, in the program. Firstly, um, to Professor Miranda Pillay. Uh, when we knew that you were to do the lecture today, we were excited, and I think you can see by the turnout that perhaps we should have stayed in the Ati Fund, right? Uh, but um, listening to you today, I was, I was just struck again by the gift that our colleague uh, Professor Dr. Doctor uh, Mary Ann Plykis van Huffel uh, was to us. And the, the one thing that I particularly remember about um, Mary was that, you know, she never allowed us to, uh, to live with half-truths or with untruths. And uh, I think one of the things that we discover is that often when there's a distance between how we live and what we believe to be true, our painful reality is that we try to bend the truth to fit our reality. And today, uh, you laid it before me. And I thank you for that. And um, I particularly want to thank you because I believe that we are created to live in community. And when we speak truthfully to one another, we show our love. And so thank you, uh, Professor Pillay, for reminding us that today we are loved and for continuing the legacy of our colleague, Mary Ann Plykis van Huffel. To Dr. Maukoto, uh, we are so grateful to you for leading us through the program and for uh, hosting us at this event today. Uh, to our Dean, Professor Reggie Nell, and to the staff from his office, uh, Mrs. Eswa Benjamin. Um, to all of the folks who set everything up for us, uh, to Malisha, to Minnie, and, and to Joseph, we are so grateful uh, that we can can be together in such a hospitable uh, place. We also want to say uh, to Reverend David van Huffel, uh, thank you uh, to you and uh, to Mary Ann's uh, sisters and to the family. Uh, it's always a wonderful gift for us to be able to share with you uh, in this special day. And uh, yeah, we, we, we're particularly uh, grateful today that, uh, that you are able to be with us uh, for, this, for this lecture. Um, also, on behalf of the colleagues uh, in the Department of Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology, um, the person who is now teaching uh, church law uh, and church history, our colleague Ashwin Tyson. Um, at the back there, we have uh, Liesel Hubert, uh, Professor Henry Mbaya. These are our colleagues immediately uh, working in the field in which uh, Mary Ann taught. And I think we can see through your work uh, that her legacy is being continued particularly amongst the students who are here. And then also uh, for the official representation of the Uniting Reform Church, uh, the moderator who is here and others, we are particularly grateful for your presence today. Friends, last of all, I think our most important thanks is to God. Uh, the God who gifts us with one another and the God who gave us the privilege and joy, who uh, gave us Mary Ann as a gift. She is a gift. Uh, that's my saying. I always tell people you are a gift. Mary Ann truly uh, was a gift. And today uh, we can see that she is the gift that keeps on giving. So may the Lord bless you. And uh, I hand uh, back over. Let's give one another uh, a thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Foster. We have come to the end of this lecture.
thank you so much for everybody that um, made their way through. And um, it was good to remember once again. Thank you so much. Please, you are more than welcome to stay for refreshments. Um, I think it was set up outside, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you are